Anyway, good evening, everybody. It's really an honor to be the recipient of this year's Chanute Award. And it's a uh, double honor for me to be speaking to such an august group of aerospace professionals. So Octave Chanute was fascinated by aviation, but he couldn't pursue his passion until after his retirement from his civil engineering career. But one of his greatest contributions was that he lived what is essentially the AIAA mission statement, and that he was committed to the advancement of aerospace, of aviation, and he did that through collaboration unselfishly with others. The Wright brothers reached out to him for information on his 1896 biplane, and he provided all that as well as provided consistent encouragement and promotion of their efforts at Kitty Hawk. So the intent of my talk is to take you on a bit of a hopscotch journey through some of my career with reflections on safety and my opinions on some lessons learned. Start off with this quote from English Captain Alfred Lamplu, made during the early days of aviation. It's, it's often seen in flight schools, airport cafes, and such. Mike Meyer, the uh, co author of, uh, of my book on paragliding, writes that it's a favorite amongst pilots for its comforting sentiment that implies what one does as a pilot is not really dangerous. It's one of those things that is so cleverly written and sounds so good that it ought to be true but it isn't. I agree with Mike. Just as standing on the top rung of an extension ladder is dangerous, anything that can impart so much total energy on a human without a guaranteed safe way of controlling it is dangerous. So aviation is inherently dangerous. It is sometimes forgiving, but it does not forgive often enough, and it does not forgive with any sense of fairness. I'd like to say that my Aviation career has been carefully planned and executed, but that would be a lie. It's really more of a Forrest Gump story where I sometimes happen to be in the right place at the right time, and other times when I thought I had been dealt a bad hand, it ended up being a professionally rewarding and a, and a great deal. So I've made not just a career, but a life out of doing things that are riskier than average. To some, downright dangerous, I've done stupid things, I've made stupid mistakes, I'm not here to justify it, more to explain some of my thought processes and to point out some things that have influenced me for better or for worse. I'm not going to talk about the programs you see there. Uh, if you see something curious, uh, you can find us at the pool after hours tonight or something or ask me Q&A afterwards if it doesn't go too long. So one of my earliest memories was when CBS broke into my morning watching of Captain Kangaroo with a special bulletin on John Glenn's orbital space flight. And I remember being intrigued by the television's black and white uh, depiction of the capsule orbiting the Earth. I grew up fascinated with the space program, eagerly watching every mission I could, devouring all the National Geographic and Life magazine articles we got at my house on space flight and the X-planes. But I never considered the possibility of trying to pursue that path in life. It was simply an impossibility. And then the February 1972 National Geographic issue was delivered. And after reading about the Apollo 15 mission, I stumbled upon another story, one that was entitled Happy Birthday Otto Lilienthal. And it highlighted a gathering on a hillside here in Southern California, not too far from here, where normal folks from all walks of life were launching themselves from hillsides on simple flying machines of their own design and construction. And they call these machines hang gliders. And now this seemed like something possible for me, but it took two years of badgering my father before he finally relented and agreed to subsidize my earnings for my paper route and allow me to purchase my first hang glider. But even after I was given my wings, it still took a couple of months of cartwheeling down the Kansas slopes before I started to get the hang of it. Hang glider design was advancing rapidly there in the 70s with greatly increased performance. And in the quest for longer and higher flights, I even tried adding a small outboard motor over my head with a pusher propeller behind my toes. Uh, but it was so underpowered that VX and VY were within a few knots of stall speed. And in gusty winds, you often stalled momentarily, but you had this really high thrust line. So it wanted to pitch down. And with the high thrust line, it wanted to pitch down bad. So you had to cut the power on it, and the throttle cable is rigged to a clothespin you held between your teeth. So if you nibbled that stall, you had to 
unclench your teeth for a second to stop the pitch down and then bite down hard a second later to try to continue the climb away from the ground. There were uh, several pilots that failed to unclench their teeth and they powered in the ground in the dive, breaking their necks. At least one pushed out too far and cut off some toes. Uh, which kind of sucks if you're trying to do foot landing. Uh, needless to say, the power pack was quickly retired. I was helping clean out a warehouse in Oklahoma, and I found a thick book that was the proceedings from a conference on low-speed aerodynamics. The book was a treasure trove of information, and I used it as a treatise to design and build an extremely high aspect ratio hang glider. I wanted the airfoil to be defined by metal battens, and I was leaning towards the Liebig airfoil, and I noticed that in the book it, there was an inscription that it was the property of Dr. Paul McCready complete with his phone number, and the good doctor had just recently won the Kremer Prize with the Gossamer Albatross, so I dialed the number from Kansas. I explained how I'd found the book and was wondering if he wanted it back, and he made it clear that he did. I think he thought I stole it. I hadn't. Uh, but I replied that I'd be happy to return it if he'd take a few moments to answer some questions about a hang glider design I was working on. And he agreed to this, and we ended up talking for the better part of an hour. He was not only extremely patient and encouraging, he told me I should not use the Liebeck airfoil, but instead should use the airfoil that he had developed for something new, the, Goss the uh, Gossamer Condor. And he ended up sending me all the airfoil data, as long as I told him I wouldn't share it with a commercial entity. So uh, that was pretty cool, and I still have his business card, which I cherish. But I learned early on, just firsthand, how a few moments of one's time can mean so much to a young person. And, and mentoring is a pillar of AIAA, and it's a major reason that I'm here today. One day, my college advisor stated, as much as you like to cut class to go hang glide, maybe you should consider joining the Air Force. Uh, that was sacrilege in my family. My father was a conscientious objector in World War II. I'd never considered the military, but I did decide to check it out. And uh, the Air Force was not, was not the least bit interested in me. The Navy and Marines were. And I made the decision to go with the Marines based on little more that, that if I got, it to, uh, got to be a jet pilot, that I had the best chance of getting to fly a cool tactical jet like the F-4, A-4, or AV-8. About the same time, my senior year, uh, I saw an announcement on the campus bulletin board that NASA was looking for a new group of astronauts. They hadn't been picking astronauts since I was in grade school. And it stated, uh, you know, they were to fly the up and coming space shuttle. It stated what the qualifications were. And suddenly I had something beyond a dream. I had a tangible goal and that goal required me to become a military test pilot. Naval flight training starts with the T-34C turbo mentor back then. Some of you here are employed in the design and manufacturing of aerospace vehicles. Most manufacturers are tasked with providing the operating manuals for their customers. And you may be pressed against giving too much information, especially by the legal team who tend to be concentrate on what could be used against the company. But I implore you as an end user to not just list the limits, but to try to provide background information. Most marine pilots get assigned to fly helicopters. So I had to do my absolute best to try to be the one or two guys in the flight school class to get selected for jets. I studied hard. I knew the operating uh, manual and the systems and the operating limits cold. And I knew that under prohibited maneuvers, the first one listed was inverted flight above 220 knots. Now what does that mean? How close to inverted qualifies as inverted? There, there was no explanation. And anyone familiar with the initial flight training program knows they would never teach acrobatics prior to a first solo, but due to a comment from a college friend, I really wanted to do some aerobatics on my first solo. Uh, I didn't want to be dumb, so I tried to prepare myself by reading ahead on how to do an aileron roll, a barrel roll, a loop, an Immelman, and a split S. And I practiced those extensively after hours in the instrument simulator. But I also wanted to fly inverted, something that air show pilots did but was not in our training syllabus and there's nothing for me to read up on. So on my first solo, I did all the syllabus aerobatic maneuvers that I wasn't supposed to know and uh, they actually went pretty well. I, I was happy. I 
started to return to base, and I remembered, hey, I wanted to fly inverted. So I literally turned it back around to the, to the warning area. And uh, I figured it'd be safer to be relatively high and best to be relatively fast. So I decided to enter at 9,000 feet and 200 knots. So what did I do? I rolled upside down. What didn't I do? I didn't pull the nose up first because I didn't realize the airplane doesn't roll around the body axis. It rolls around the velocity vector. So I entered inverted flight about 10 degrees nose low. I tried to push the nose back up to level, but it it was uncomfortable, and duh, it took more than minus one G. So I was kind of working at it, and of course the nose was dropping. I don't know what my airspeed was, but I'm pretty sure it was above 220 knots by that point in time, but I wasn't having fun, so I decided to abort the maneuver by rolling out. It didn't. I didn't understand what was going on, but it wasn't rolling, and it felt strange. So I instantly committed to doing the second split S of my life, this one starting from an extremely high speed. I yanked the power to idle, I set four Gs on the G meter, knowing that the limit was 4.5. Strangely, the world began disappearing in front of me. I was getting tunnel vision. The G meter had my full attention, and I continued to hold 4.0 until I couldn't read it anymore. But I was so conscious, so I tried to hold that load on my butt. And, uh, you know, the red line was 280. I don't, don't know what airspeed I got to. I was a skinny runner with a very low heart rate, had never had any anti-G training. There was no reason for it if you weren't assigned to jets. My next memory was waking up, slumped to the side of the seat in a 30-degree nose-high climb, and, or sorry, in a nose-high climb, 30-degree right bank, and I had completely blacked out. Uh, with my tail firmly between my legs, I flew back to the, the widening field, landed like any red-blooded kid that didn't want anything to interfere with their quest to fly fighters. I didn't tell a soul about it. A few months later, I did get assigned to jet training, and I was out processing on what coincidentally happened to be a safety stand-down day. I stood in the back of the auditorium while I awaited some signatures on my paperwork, and a major was up on the stage grilling the audience on limitations. And when the student answered the inverted flight limitation, the instructor then asked, does anybody know why that limitation exists? Room was silent. Because, he said, the ailerons lose effectivity. Hmm. <laughs> Suddenly I understood the rest of the story and why I was unable to roll upright that day. And it really drove home the point to me how to not only know limitations, but to try to understand the why behind them. In the years since, there have been less fortunate pilots. T-34 has crashed multiple times because of loss of control at altitude. And they eventually added this to the flight manual. T-34 has even crashed due to G-induced loss of consciousness. And one accident pointed out that your G tolerance is significantly tempor temporarily reduced if you proceed it with negative G. Good to know. Uh, incidentally, the Spaceship 2 reentry profile, you know, it doesn't normally pull negative G, but during reentry, you transition from zero G to about five Gs over the course of 30 seconds. So uh, to train for that, we used an extra 300 aerobatic airplane. And for conservative, conservatism, I had everybody start out with 15 seconds at negative 1G before transitioning into the simplified reentry profile. So maybe some good came out of it. So I challenge you designers to provide that why to your operators, because after all, operators, especially Marines, I think, have a knack for using products in ways not envisioned by the designers. I continue to spend many hours in the simulator on my own time, practicing all the syllabus maneuvers uh, and trying to learn the upcoming lessons ahead of time before they were officially taught to me. It worked out well for me, I guess. But I, was, I became very comfortable doing exacting maneuvers on the instruments. During the basic jet phase, I was on a night flight with a young instructor, and we completed the required instrument training plan, and he started doing aerobatics. And then he gave me the chance. And night aerobatics wasn't in the syllabus, but I enjoyed the experience, and I continued to challenge myself in such ways. I got my you know, dream assignment, first choice F4s out of Hawaii at a time when the fleet suffered from old equipment, bad accident rates, insufficient flying hours, and poor morale. And the leadership 
seem to be addressing the issue by putting tighter handcuffs on operations. We were all required to watch a video from the senior marine aviator and the general gave his thoughts on safety and stated he didn't just want to know who was running red traffic lights, he wanted to know which pilots were running yellow lights uh, because they didn't have the right safety attitude. And I don't run red lights and when I, the light's green I try to anticipate it turning yellow so I have a game plan. But I remember thinking what kind of psychology are they trying to develop in a marine fighter pilot because I'm pretty sure that the recipe for cultivating the safest pilot in peacetime will not cultivate the best tactical pilot, the kind the country expects to carry out their missions in times of war. I mean, wouldn't the absolute safest pilot only fly in the most beautiful and safe conditions? But how safe will they be when they encounter an unexpected storm or a challenging tactical scenario? Speaking at a Western Society of Engineers in Chicago, Wilbur Wright alluded to the risk of flying with a statement that seems to apply equally to life itself. In the F-4 training squadron, I learned that to do a loop, he started at 400 knots in full afterburner or 500 knots in military power. One day, I was reading the classified tactical manual, and there was a statement that said, if you're uncomfortable being 90 degrees nose high at 200 knots, then you hadn't been there enough. Now the thought of being that slow in a phantom while going straight up made me nervous, but I practiced it again and again and again until I could eventually hold it in the vertical till 120 knots and still consistently, not all the time, but consistently recover. Uh, when a world-renowned photographer came to the squadron to take some photos in the vertical, the skipper announced me as the demonstration pilot. So I believe that if you want to be able to maximum perform a conventional airplane, then you have to be willing to occasionally exceed the maneuvering limits so that you can comfortably recognize them. And, you know, more modern, if you have a highly unstable aircraft and want carefree handling, then you need a great fly-by-y system with predictive limiting. I was out on a night intercept flight, uh, and the other airplane had a problem, had to return to base, and with nothing else to do, I began doing aerobatics at night over the ocean. Didn't think much about it. I got personal rules for maximum dive angles and minimum altitudes, and I was following all those. And my backseater calmly asked if I realized that I was the only pilot in the squadron that did aerobatics at night or in the clouds. And it, that actually surprised me. And I thought about that and realized that maybe if I had never been exposed to that early on in my training, I might not have thought it was OK and continued to train for it. But of course, there are both positive and negative takeaways from that. It shows just how powerful a mentor can be and that a young, impressionable student can learn good as well as potentially bad habits. Shortly after I left that group, an aircraft and crew were lost at night in a high-speed dive while simply flying back out to the cap point for a subsequent intercept. No ejection, the crew was lost at sea, and vertigo or disorientation was blamed. Um, perhaps if they had more aggressive training, they would have been able to properly scan and interpret the instruments and survive. I'm also sure that my ease of flying unusual attitudes on the instruments benefited my spaceship flying, where we had to fly a rather exacting profile into the vertical. It was all done on instruments into a very black sky. So you're not just a better pilot, you're a safer pilot if you're trained and comfortable operating your aircraft at the design limits. I like looking at things with a criti critical eye, learning the lessons learned, sometimes finding things that I think were missed. In 1996, I transferred to NASA's Flight Research Center. Then it was named after the first director, Hugh Dryden, who said their mission was to separate the real from the imagined. And that mission statement just immediately resonated with me. It applies to so much we all do. It isn't just proving that an aircraft can fly supersonic. It means separating the real risks from the imagined ones. And it is not wrong to imagine risks that are not real. It should be part of any brainstorming session. The real tragedy comes when you have an accident due to an unimagined cause, like the Apollo 1 fire. So our goal should be to imagine all the risks, dismiss those that we determine to be unrealistic, and then concentrate on mitigating the true hazards. 
One thing that I have a jauntist eye towards are the folks that think that classic hazard analyses is an accurate representation of how safe your program is. We obviously want hazard analyses to be as accurate as possible, and I hope it continues to develop. But I still see too many cases where what comes out as a quantitative assessment seems to be based on little more than wishing at probabilities. Now, as a case in point, NASA sold the space shuttle on a one in 10,000 probability of failure. In the end, they lost two shuttles and crews out of a grand total of 135 missions. And that was NASA, and I continue to put NASA on a pretty high pedestal. Not too many years ago, I had some oversight of a major government flight test program that had a 10 to the minus 6 failure. They successfully recovered back to base, and of course they had to brief the management about what happened, how that could have happened, and why that won't happen again. They got blessed to return the flight, and on the very next flight had another one in a million failure. They stood down for quite a while after that, uh, but this was a very experienced aerospace company and test team. A few years ago, former Society of Experimental Test Pilots uh, President Turbo Tomasetti presented an interesting paper about if you'd rather be lucky than good. And that spawned my hang glider buddy, Mike Meyer, another SCTP member, to come up with something even better, and I find it a great way to help characterize, visualize risk. On the left vertical axis is how technically mature or skilled the project is, and on the right is how good your judgment and decision making is. The area under the line between the two is an indication of your risk posture. So I visualize it as the volume of your safety reservoir. In this example, we have a te technically mature system and our team is highly skilled, utilizes great disciplined decision making. Well, I think we have accumulated a full tank of safety and have a high probability of safe operations. Doesn't guarantee it, but the odds favor it. Now, if you have the same technical maturity but occasionally make bad decisions or find it too easy to justify waiving flight rules, well, you're accumulating less safety in your tank and you're reducing your odds of being safe. Obviously, if you have a lot of technical risk, you're unskilled and use bad judgment, you know, like me on my first solo flight, well, you're rolling the dice with every event. No aerospace company with this talent set could remain in business for the long term. Now, let's take something that we know is risky, say the flutter expansion of a new type of wing construction. But we did extensive ground testing and analyses, and we have outstanding rules and procedures for expanding the envelope. We certainly have to recognize the elevated risk, but we hopefully have done our homework well enough to conduct safe, offer, safe operations as we build up our technical prowess for future operations. But the million dollar question for you, for us, heck, it may be a billion dollar question for your program, is how sure are we of our technical maturity? our skills, and our decision making. Do we make excuses for flat events? Do we think we are better pilots than we are? Do we think our test team always makes the right decisions simply because we haven't had an accident yet? These unknowns, whether they're on the left side of the graph or the right side of the graph, or both, put huge uncertainties into our ability to quantify the amount of safety in our reservoir. So Mike pointed out that there are three things we can do up front that will improve our safety. We should address, we should do all of those things, but we should strive to really do number three because reducing the number and significance of those unknowns has the benefit of reducing the opportunity for luck to play a part in the outcome while also improving the accuracy of our post-flight analyses regarding the quality of our decision making. So instead of worrying about quantifying safety, I try my best to honestly evaluate our risk of encountering unknowns. I think about what can and might go wrong and look at ways to mitigate the risks and to be prepared for those failures. And part of that means studying history. Sometimes I feel that I find lessons learned that either escaped the test team or perhaps were never publicized. The X-31 crashed after being told that the flight was complete. It was returning to base on what would have likely have been the very last flight of the test program anyway. And there were many links in this accident chain, but it really begins with the test team knowing their vehicle. 
This accident briefing has been given numerous times. It's available on YouTube, but I feel there are a couple of points that they failed to make. As a refresher, the X-31 was designed to demonstrate enhanced fighter maneuverability. They did this by using large canards and thrust vectoring on a highly unstable airframe. Keeping this Bronco tame required a highly augmented closed-loop fly-by-wire flight control system. The designers recognized that certain failures could render the aircraft uncontrollable and unrecoverable, so they included reversionary modes for the pilot to select prior to loss of control. And, they, and that would allow for a safe recovery, uh, a, you know, hard of the envelope recovery for a landing. So these three pilot selectable modes were for right gyro failures, alpha and beta failures, and uh, pedostatic air data failures. These were selectable via push buttons right in front of the pilot, just below the heads up display. Good location. Now were the three push buttons labeled something pilot friendly like right gyros, alpha beta, and air data? Nope, they were labeled R1, R2, and R3. Now if you only have a couple of heartbeats between a failure and an unrecoverable loss of vehicle, wouldn't it make sense to re remove as much conscious thought as possible from the uh, equation, both for the pilot and for the control room? So as designers and manufacturers, we need to do our part to make it easier on the end users, even if our end user is a supposedly highly trained and intelligent test pilot. There were a few people in the control room that day that knew the information, knew information that the pilot and those controlling the flight had forgotten. They knew that errors were being made. It's well known that if you discover an accident on a deserted road, well, you, you stop, you call 911, you see what you can do for help. But if you witness an accident on the five, crowded highway, you're much more likely to assume that somebody else is taking care of it. Don't let that mental mentality invade your control room. Don't assume that somebody smarter than you or in a higher supervisory position would have spoken up if it was important. Weekly boldface testing. Many org organizations choose to have weekly tests on critical, uh, memorized critical action procedures. You have to write all the emergency procedures down from rote memory in the proper order with the exact uh, wording. And every flight brief normally has a, a spot for briefing the emergency procedure of the day. The organizations that do this typically have a list. So, you know, oh, the eighth of the month is always hydraulic failure. I hate those things. Not because I don't want to be tested, but because they promote uh, rope memorization of a limited set of canned emergencies, and so often we lose aircraft due to more complex links in the chain. As an example, you know, if the X-31's EP of the day was airspeed failure, the response could have been a very short select R3 and RTB, well, and consider it complete. But the training would be much more effective if the test team dove into what could cause the airspeed problem. How such problems could be detected both on board and off board. What holes might there be in the automatic logic and the effect on the different disciplines and how they could work together or should work together to address them. And so my case in point on that was the automatic logic could detect a sudden loss of airspeed like from a bird strike, but it could not detect a slow one, such as what happened on the accident day, by slow icing of the pitot tube. And those are the kinds of things that should be discussed and understood to increase safety. For years, these words had adorned the walls of the NASA MCC, but they were no longer on the wall when the X-31 crashed. I think it's a great reminder to have on the wall. The X-31 team never trained with their reversionary modes, and this is, it was in stark contrast to the X-29 team that often used reversionary modes at the end of the data runs for both pilot and MCC training. You need to understand your vehicle and the seriousness of the consequences. If failure consequences are serious, like the loss of airspeed in a highly augmented aircraft, then you must knock it off and configure for a safe recovery. Every generation, we dramatically demonstrate that a test mission is not over just because you're not doing test points or your RTB. It's also not over until you're in the chocks and shut down. Everybody's busy these days, 
But if it's a prototype, experimental, or highly modified aircraft, then please avoid the temptation of allowing control room personnel to go back to their other office duties prior to engine shutdown. When is it okay to push? When should you pause? This makes me think of the Spaceship Two program after the horrible crash of the prototype Spaceship Two Enterprise built and tested by, Virgin, uh, by Scaled Composites. Virgin Galactic decided to finish the next spaceship that they were already working on through their manufacturing arm called the Spaceship Company, and then to do the flight tests themselves. I resigned from Scaled Composites and joined the VG team as their lead test pilot. For years, the VG team had really just been monitoring the scale design, manufacturing, and flight testing, essentially being program managers and critics, and now they had to step up and execute, and that requires a different personality set, a different skill set. It's easy to be a critic. It's much harder to sign your name to a design, a procedure, or a test plan saying it's safe. The company had like an order of magnitude more people on the program than scale had, and to their credit, they're really trying to dot their I's and cross their T's, but they basically refused to trust any of the data that Scaled had generated with Enterprise. While it may be encouraged in some situations uh, when you believe you're better than others, whether it's companies, test teams, or pilots, well, I think you're laying the groundwork to be more dangerous. I don't recommend that philosophy for flight test teams, yet I've seen it throughout my career. It's great to be great, but you can ill afford to rest on your laurels. On the first crewed Captain Carey flight of Spaceship Two Enterprise, the scale team flew White Knight Two mothership from slow speed to V&E at multiple altitudes, doing full control sweeps of the spaceship surf control surfaces. But with Spaceship Two Unity, the new one, VG was very concerned with imparting structural loads on the airframes and made a very small envelope of allowable loads. To expand beyond that required either significant analyses or testing, and all of that was going to come, but in the meantime, the team had to live with what I felt to be bizarre limitations. With them being so concerned about imparting loads, we were only allowed to do control movements at slow speeds and with a very limited range of horizontal stab settings. So Spaceship Two Unity's one and only planned captive carry flight prior to the first glide flight was little more than a limited systems checkout. But was that really the best risk posture for the program? I was the, the pilot in command for that first glide flight. We aborted prior to the drop due to building crosswinds. But we thought we had a good spaceship, so we rescheduled for a better day. This time, the weather was better, and as we approached the countdown to release, I finally got to the clearance to do a control sweep per the normal pre-drop procedures, and it didn't feel right. I reported that and was given permission to do more sweeps. It was obvious that, that there was a almost bizarre level of, of uh, friction in the control system. It wasn't right, we aborted the drop. It turned out that the VG design engineer had changed the Elevon bearing design from what Scale had used. And we sure had not set out to test a new Elevon bearing design after being cold soaked at altitude. I had asked for all the design changes from the original design and an entirely new Elevon bearing design was not on that list. So what else had changed that we didn't know about and that required testing? It required a rather embarrassing downtime while we surveyed all of the engineering change requests and ensured they were properly tested, and that included multiple captive carry flights. I was uh, not happy that we got that close to releasing uh, with such a flight control issue, but I was very glad that I had flown enough Enterprise pr flights previously to know it wasn't right. Now contrast that with when it was time to start the powered flight phase. By that time, we had cleared out the critical transonic flutter region with what was, had been intended to be a final high angle dive glide flight. Unfortunately, at the end of the flutter maneuvers, there was a loads test point and I had a very serious issue with the supersonic flight control actuators under load and I struggled to regain control. After that scary flight, the VP of safety told me there'd be no way that the next flight which was planned to be a rocket flight, would be a rocket-powered flight. I mean, what sane person wouldn't demand demonstrating proper functionality in a glide flight prior to lighting a rocket motor? 
I didn't argue, I just requested that he let us address the problems, test them, see where we stood, and listen to our rationale before making such a formal decision. Separating the real from the imagined also means understanding the total risk posture. So we were very concerned with stabilizer actuator loads under supersonic boost. But how did we test for those? How could we test for those in a glide flight? It required a release above 50,000 feet with an immediate steep dive to the max keys limit, which I held at 20,000 feet, did a hard 5G turn with a hard reversal under loads. And as I learned firsthand, if one of the actuators stalls, that you're now doing an unusual attitude recovery at near max Q at a relatively low altitude, and the only way to survive is to somehow recover. Now, where does that critical actuator loading occur on a powered flight? It occurs well after max Q in a steep climb where if you abort, you coast under decreasing loads to an apogee. You can deploy the feather to recover, and you have many seconds to select a backup mode or troubleshoot and recover the primary. So such an abort is certainly not a walk in the park, but it's a heck of a lot safer in my book than seeing the earth coming up at you fast with very few options. The team successfully addressed the actuator issues and extensively tested the actuator in a cold chamber under loads. Thankfully, we got the blessing to push onto what I felt was a safer rocket-powered flight. The actuator did fine. I think that was a good example of the proper identification of overall risk, and I'm glad we could push that way. But how long should we burn the rocket motor? There are a bunch of people, including a former space shuttle pilot, arguing for a 15 second burn, and they presented historical justifications. The first powered flight of Spaceship One was 15 seconds, and my first powered flight of Spaceship Two Enterprise was 16 seconds. Virgin was insisting on, on their own glide data, why shouldn't they not insist on their own powered flight data and start with the same you know, burn duration? So, Learning from history means taking the time to do more than look at a Wikipedia page. It's just like learning limitations. The why behind the decision is of paramount importance. I knew the background. Does anybody here know why Bert Rutan chose 15 seconds for that first burn of Spaceship One? They were awaiting the launch license from the FAA. They didn't have it. Turned out that anything, there was a loophole, anything 15 seconds or shorter was considered a model rocket. They had not anticipated that that model rocket could be air launched and crewed by a pilot. <laughs> and if you know anything about rocket engines, you know that they don't scale up or scale down readily. Spaceship One had a 15,000 pound thrust class rocket motor, while Spaceship Two was targeting north of 60,000 pounds. Scaled rocket motor supplier was having issues with burn stability. It got to the point where the program decided just to qualify a motor for 30 seconds so we could at least do some initial powered flights uh, with the hope that they could continue working on the rocket motor and eventually get to full duration. Program management decreed a 10 second buffer from what those engines were qualified for, so we ended up with three rocket motors that we could burn for up to 20 seconds. So we did the 16 second first burn to clear that transonic flutter and do an initial loads on the H stab. And then the two subsequent flights were increasing Mach and increasing loads on the H stabs. But by the time VG was ready to fly powered flights on Unity, the VG rocket motor team had taken it over. They'd created a motor that ran beautifully, full duration, nice huge envelope of temperatures. Uh, and we had done much more ground testing by that time with loads testing that scale had ever done. And I was quite confident in the airframe and the motor. So the real unknowns for me were the flying qualities of the higher Mach and lower Q and the thermal heating that came with the Mach and altitude expansion. Now, if you've seen the cockpit videos of the 16 and 20 second burns, you'd know they were extremely busy. You accelerate to supersonic trim, you start to turn to the vertical, the motor shuts down, now you have two thirds of your few solid fuel in the back, which means an extremely FCG that you can't do anything about. Two thirds of your liquid oxidizer is behind you sloshing around and you're above lim uh, landing limit weight, so you have to dump that. Uh, you get a tank over pressure because of the stirring of the, of the fluids, and it requires immediate bold-faced actions by the co-pilot. 
pilot. And that's something that really would be nice to use crew resource management for, but you can't because a pilot's flying attention has to be dedicated to maintaining the critical abort trajectory. It's a critical situation which is not unlike what faced Jaeger in his NF-104. And this is a, as opposed to a space flight, where once the motor shuts down, you can play patty cake for a couple of minutes before you have to think about reentry. So speaking of Jaeger, many of you are likely familiar with the right stuff scene or, and his infamous ejection from the rocket-powered NF-104. Unfortunately, in my view, that tail is usually spun as a stuck RCS jet when it was the loss of that aircraft was really due to pilot error caused by overconfidence to the point of obstinance. He was so un intent on beating the 120,000 foot plus altitude record that younger Major Bob White had just set five days prior that he was pulling well past the angle of attack limits in his misguided attempts to get higher. Instead, the excessive induced drag resulted in him topping out lower and lower with every subsequent flight. And uh, so he was exceeding the angle of attack limits and trying to use RCS to get it back to recover. Well, on the accident flight, he pulled such an extreme AOA, there was so much drag, he barely beat 100,000 feet, and the motor was still burning as he was descending. Uh, and he didn't have the RCS authority at that altitude. So partial burn Spaceship Two flights are very similar. You go high enough that you have poor aer aerodynamic control, but low enough that the reaction control system can only help if you're within a few degrees of where you need to be. And in the case of Spaceship Two's steep near vertical climb and reentry, that proper recovery attitude from a shorter burn is not a fixed pitch attitude. So one of the big unknowns in the, w was the stability in the feathered uh, configuration as we decelerated back through the transonic region. If it was dynamically unstable, it might be okay if you transitioned through that region quickly. Uh, but if you dwelled in that region, it might be long enough for it to diverge and do something bad or just get high structural loads. After reentry from a space flight, the projections showed that that time in the transonic region would be about 15 seconds. But there is a range of burns from around 35 seconds to 50 seconds where the time spent in that region could be nearly three times that. I knew some of the original scaled brainiacs had been very concerned about avoiding that regime until they had flight test data from going through it. And I had enough respect for their knowledge to, to carry that flag. By this time, I'd been promoted to be the director of flight tests, and I'd flown all the previously successful rocket flights on Enterprise and was assigned to fly Unity's first powered flight. I felt my opinion should carry some weight. But I also knew uh, it had to be based on as much data and physics as possible. We had an interesting organizational structure. The flight test fell under TSC engineering. I've seen flight tests as its own directorate. I've seen it fall under engineering as well as flight operations. I'm not hard over on which is correct. To me, the people and the working relationships are what matters. Any of those organizational constructs can succeed and they can fail. I had decades of flight test experience with multiple military, government, and civilian companies, and up until Virgin, the test team's role was to prove to engineering management that the proposed flight test plan was required and technically sound, and to prove to the safety office that the risks had been identified and properly mitigated. But Virgin's VP of safety kept on trying to dictate the test plan, and this caused a lot of friction because I didn't agree with his philosophy, which in my mind was based on classical incremental aircraft envelope expansion. I kept on trying to argue that as long as we had abort points for the unexpected exceedances, that our overall risk did not decrease with speed and apogee, but could actually decrease with longer duration burns. So I set out to educate myself as well as build team consensus and I approached each discipline with the basic question, what do you need for powered flight data to declare your discipline ready for commercial operations? What are your limiting factors? How big of steps can you take between them? And what should your first step be and why? And with that knowledge, I could figure out the constraints, plan the number of flights, assign test points to flight cards. In the end, I disciplined consensus to target 50 seconds for Unity's first burn. And I had my immediate engineering management support for that. That was until about 10 seconds in the first big 
come to Jesus' meeting when he did an about face and said, let's compromise and do 30 seconds. Well, at least I beat 15 and it beat 35. Remember that so we had cleared the glide envelope to the forward and aft CG limits. I think it's important to point out that a powered flight begins at the aft CG limit, and then as fuel is consumed, it moves to mid-range. There is no way to get start with a mid-range or forward CG on a powered flight unless you bizarrely ballast for it in ways that you could never do operationally. So what's the proper risk reduction for that first powered flight CG? For my enterprise flights, we used it near aft limit CG, but the Galactic Flight Sciences team was insisting on the mid CG, kind of what you do on a glide flight, right? We trained extensively in the simulator with the best ability and control data uh, predictions that we had. But since they were based on CFD, we also investigated what we called one, two, and three sigma deviations. One sigma deviations required active piloting. Two sigma deviations really had my attention. I could usually control them, but depending on the parameter, I might lose control. Three sigma, well, let's pray that our predictions were better than three sigma. But the lesson we really learned was that you had to abort prior to getting to that cliff's edge of stability and control, because if you crossed over that, the resulting coupled departure could exceed structural limits, which might well be catastrophic. In our 1G fixed base simulator, you couldn't feel building side slip or angular rates. So you had to rely on the instruments, and we had a memorized ladder of side slip, lateral G, and roll rate limitations that changed with mock. So what happened on Unity's first powered flight? Well, the motor burned great, thermal heating trends were fine, but unlike my three previous flights of Enterprise, I had increasing lateral directional challenges as the burn progressed. I was walking the fine line between PIO and roll rate limits when I saw a snap departure on the primary flight display. I yelled, abort, 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 and the co-pilot reached down, hit the big red button. Unbeknownst to me, the rocket motor had already hit the 30-second timer, and it was shutting down anyway. It turned out that what I perceived as a departure was actually just a tumble of the INSs due to a quaternion conversion error at high pitch going through at high roll angles. Kind of the equivalent of the F-22, you know, first time it flew across the international dateline. We had received a software patch from the manufacturer, and our avionics lead had deemed it non-critical and chose not to update the units prior to the flight due to concerns about a late configuration change. But in his defense, the supplier, the supplier had not properly communicated the software changes and the critical bugs that were fixed. So if you use a COT system, ensure it's qualified for the environment you intend to use it in. We should have had a ground test fixture that ran the INS through the full attitude spectrum. We didn't. Just hold it in your hand and do that was not good enough. If a supplier suggests a firmware or software update, ensure the SME pushes them to fully understand what fixes are included and the urgency of the update. Does it require additional testing? The good news was that the spaceship was now handling great. I was smoothly lowering the nose to wings level at upright attitude with zero roll or yaw rates. The bad news was the quaternion issue meant that the primary flight display was reading exactly the opposite of reality. Notice my PFD shows wings level with blue sky over brown earth. If you could see that my co pilots you'd see his was showing exactly the same. But unfortunately, they were the opposite of reality, and I was quite surprised when the Earth came into view from above. Giving me that shocking realization that my critical attitude control task was starting from inverted. <laughs> Since we had great INS fault detection and enunciation, and all these miscompare and faults, there were none of those. I, because they were following the software, right? I concluded that there must be a downstream data issue and I didn't know what to trust. I just shut it down uh, as far as looking at the displays. And remember, the previous powered flight resulted in death and destruction when the feather was simply unlocked at the wrong speed. So here I was calling for feathering based only, based only on my best guess. The great news was the loads were fine. I was able to set a stable attitude, do a yaw turn back around to the proper orientation as I aero braked to an upright attitude. 
So why were the handling qualities so much different for such just a minor mock expansion from the previous powered flights? Amazingly, after we plugged the flight test derived data you know, into the aero tables, went in the sim, it sim flew like the airplane, which wasn't good. And uh, they wanted, we really wanted to do another flight in a few weeks, so uh, they were pushing for more forward CG, because obviously that should work. And after an hour of crappy results in the simulator, at the end of the time, I said, please humor me, and let's do one run with an aft CG and a nominal nozzle scarf. Scarfing the nozzle gives you a little bit of thrust vectoring, and it's important. And you know it's important to have the proper thrust relationship with CG at low Q, which could be early in the burn, and also at burnout. Uh, so they did that, and it flew fine. The good news was, uh, you know, I guess it was good news. It turned out that non-representative forward CG and the uh, not as aggressively scarfed nozzle caused this slow pitch rate so that when we went to this mock region, we were at a lot higher angle of attack than we would be on a nominal flight. Um, the great news is now we had a good plan. We did a repeat flight just a few weeks later, flew fine. Real versus imagined risks. The bad news it was the safety management team decreed that the third flight would be a 42 second burn, which was in the heart of the envelope I wanted to avoid. Because uh, it would achieve an apogee with so high that you'd have even less aerodynamic control, but still little uh, RCS authority, a limited time window to use it in. It couldn't save you if you screwed up, and unfortunately that's exactly what happened. They lost control, they ran out of the primary, selected backup, they ran that dry, did a tumbling reentry. The vehicle is down for months of repairs. If your company's run by the marketing or legal department, well, you probably don't advertise your failures. Virgin provided a highly edited video clip that implied the flight was a total success. It wasn't difficult for the investigative reporter that had been following our progress to know something serious had happened. The lack of any video uh, after Apogee or of the reentry made it pretty obvious. And I'm sure there were many people on the shop floor that could whisper something off the record, something happened. He called me up after deducing that we had a serious stability and control issue and wanted to know how scared I was to fly it. And we didn't have it stability and control issue. And I felt if he reported that, it would be much worse for the company than admitting the truth and having a plan to do better next time. Uh, so I explained it to him. I hung up, immediately called the company president and told him what I did and why. He accepted it. As the director of flight test, I have to ensure that the proper lessons are learned, and that comes as frank and honest debriefs. Failure to admit mistakes likely only fools yourself, but if your position Wield, if you can use your position to wield power to intimidate your team, honestly, like Jaeger did after the NF-104, you risk deadly damage to your program or worse. And there are folks in my profession who feel that such discussions should never see public like this. And I sure would rather not, but what if private discussions fail to learn the proper lessons or accomplish the proper change? It isn't just test pilots that can let egos or some misguided code of silence interfere with safety. It happens in plenty of other critical arenas like hospital operating rooms and police departments. I think we owe it to the industry, the people involved and the non-involved, to ensure we learn the proper lessons. We should never be above reproach. After those flight de details were publicly unveiled with Nick Schmidl's book in 2021, the company president, the CEO, each individually spoke to me about that issue with the pilot's egos, and the CEO assured me, they both assured me it would not be tolerated in the future, and the CEO assured me that the company would be transparent with any issues in the future, and then on that very next flight, in my opinion, they were anything but. Well, already then. I remain a big fan of Spaceship 2. I think it's a viable design and can offer an amazing customer experience when flown right. With that, I'll leave you with a couple of final comments. There are no perfect processes. Perfect safety requires proper processes, but proper processes do not guarantee safety. You must always use good judgment, and everyone must take responsibility for that safety. Lastly, paraphrasing some words of Roger Smith, 
story test pilot, former NASA boss of mine, and last year's Chanute winner. If you think you cannot afford a design change to fix a known issue or take the time and money to do the proper ground or flight test, then you should try having an accident. You'll learn just what you can and cannot afford. And for those of you that might be interested, here's a recent photo from a couple weeks ago celebrating the 49th anniversary of my first flight. With that, I'll open up to any questions or you can meet me afterwards. Thank you for your time.